Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. All of our webinars are interactive. We encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. Well, there we have it for you. Very nice to be with you today. Uh, Stuart Lohman, my colleague, is uh, in the other studio, big studio. I'm in the little studio. Good to see you, Stu. I'm glad you're up here in Johannesburg. Good to be here, Alec. We've got fantastic weather as always. It's one thing the half felt definitely trumps Cape Town on, I think. <laughs> yeah, and, and also, I'll tell you what, when you have a look at the portfolio, because remember last month, we, would, we did this in Cape Town. And I would take yeah. Joburg any day of the week when you have a look at the way <laughs> the portfolio has, has improved dramatically since, uh, well, in the last month. It's been quite an astonishing uh, performance. But anyway, it's, it is what it is. And uh, just uh, before we get going, let's have a look at the technicals. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. A little half hour button on the control panel on the right hand side. If you can hear my voice clearly and see Alec and myself on screen, can you just give us some high fives just so we know we're coming through? Excellent. I've got some high fives. We also like to keep it conversational. I know Alec does this presentation, but please put your questions through. There's a little question mark on that control panel as well. If you put them in, I'll pass them on to Alec. But are we all good to go, Alec? I just think you need to show your screen. Sorry. Uh, I'm about to do that in a second. Um to make sure we've got everything the way it should be. I apologize, Mr. Lohman. Um, right, let's go. Is showing my screen, taking away my Perfect. pretty, can I take away my pretty face? Is that okay? Do we? I think we, we can go off now. Okay, <laughs> all right, and your pretty face. Actually, you got a pretty face. I, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, okay, let's not, <laughs> let's not go into that <laughs> conversation. Good to see everybody there, and uh, and thanks again. As Stu says, this is interactive. There is a question mark on the question mark. Go along to it, type in your questions. He will uh, stop me, and uh, and we'll then go straight to them. So we've got we've got an hour to talk about this portfolio. Um, I've put there as the headline: relief rally after February's sharp losses, but actually. The headline of this should be we're buying into crypto yeah we're going to be buying our making our very first cryptocurrency investment tonight when the uh when when the u.s markets open it's not in the business web trader portfolio it'll be in the business shift portfolio the little portfolio we'll see how it goes then and then we'll uh, have a look at shift uh, at crypto a little bit further just to remind you how this all works we started the web trader portfolio seven and now a quarter, seven years and three months ago. That was in December 2014. Uh, we continue to run that portfolio, but because it has got so big, it's now started at um, just over two and a quarter million rand. It's now over 10 million rand because of the compounded growth. Uh, we want to, to give those who hadn't been investing over the last seven years an opportunity to purchase shares uh, as well. And in a model portfolio, remember uh, how this one also works is that the shift portfolio, I have put $30,000 of my own money into it to make sure that I understand how it works and also to give you an accurate reflection of exactly, exactly what everything costs after we have the investment into a well the, the costs etc so i do everything over shift in the same way as you would do everything over shift we uh, started it as a ten thousand dollar portfolio which meant we had to leave out some of our favorite stocks particularly amazon.com uh, but good news there is that amazon is going to have a, a share split soon 24 one share split 
and that means that we'll be able to add Amazon into the portfolio in June. But the big story for today, as far as we are concerned anyway, is the purchase of Bitcoin, and I'll be going into that a little bit later. Uh, first off, though, let's start the portfolio, and you can see that last month, uh, the month of February, month ago, 24th of February was the last webinar, uh, exactly a month ago. Uh, it would have been a really good time to buy the dip, and it was interesting. We had a member of the community drop me an email when to you got down to nine dollars in fact it was even lower i think we got to 925 uh, and he said surely i should be mortgaging my house and putting that money into to you and i wrote back and said it's your call uh, but certainly it it, uh, it to me that's not really sensible investing i don't think i would have slept at night if i'd gone out and taken a huge mortgage on my house to invest into you uh, but i think our community member if he'd done that uh, he can now cash in his chips and get 25% upside uh, because surely at, at $9.60 to you was looking like a, it was just ridiculously cheap. I still think it's very cheap at the moment still. Um, and I'll give you some insight into that just, uh, just in, in a second. But you shouldn't really punt. This is not a punting portfolio. We're not at business. We are long-term investors. Heavens, I wrote a book about it uh, based on the uh, the way that Warren Buffett invests in, you can still get it. I saw it at exclusive books the other day, although it was written five, six years ago. There are a few copies still knocking around and that book is called Invest Like Warren Buffett. I'm looking at doing an update, obviously, because it's long overdue, but in there, it's all about you buy into a company, you hold it for an average time of forever, which means that you certainly aren't trading it. But to our community member who clearly decided that to you was a, a just too good to miss, um, congratulations because you made 25% in the past month. The reason why it really was a, a standout, to you has very recently acquired uh, a company called edX for 800 million US dollars, and we still got money in the bank as well. Uh, edX is um, a bigger company than the one we know in South Africa called Udemy. Udemy is, is part of NicePass. Um, and Udemy's market cap is around, or valuation when they last put money in, is around $3 billion. So to you did a great deal with edX, which had been created by Harvard and Yale, two of the great universities in the United States. Um, and the market valuation of the whole company, apart from the money that to you has got in the bank, and this recent acquisition was only at uh, 700 million US dollars. It's sitting now at about 900 million uh, US dollars. So if you could go along and buy the company, clearly you'd, you'd like to do that, uh, given the true valuation of it. Anyway, thanks to, uh, you, to you over the past month. Um, the reason why it got down to $9.60 when we last spoke, and indeed to even lower than that, was because of this complete uh, panic that Mr. Mark had had during February. And of course, uh, subsequent to that, we it, it went even lower because of the Ukraine invasion by Russia. But who knows how these things, uh, these bumps, how many bumps they're going to be on the road. What we're doing with this portfolio uh, is to, both portfolios indeed are long term. Um, and in this portfolio in particular, it's one where you purchase the stocks and you just hold them indefinitely. The shift portfolio is very, very new. We've only just started that four months ago and that's still going to be settling down. But uh, we're talking here about the web trader portfolio to start off with. In other words, the big one and uh, our smallest stock actually had the biggest gain. A zero, you know all about zero. If you've been at, on these uh, webinars, it is one of our favorite stocks as well, up 14%, amazon.com lifted significantly on the news that it's going to be doing a 20 for one uh, share split. We like that so much because we couldn't add Amazon into the shift portfolio as mentioned earlier, because there just wasn't, uh, well, in a $10,000 portfolio, you can't put $3,200 into a single stock. That's 32% into one share. Doesn't make sense, obviously. Uh, nice moves for Microsoft and Apple. And those are our big three, of course, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple. So all three were up well. 
Nice to see Purple Capital remaining uh, strong there. I'm still a huge bull on Purple Capital. Sure, it's come down from over 300 uh, rands a share, uh, but it is the one exponential company on the JSC that is well worth investing in. Uh, Easy Equities is its, um, is its best known asset, but within the Easy Equities group, uh, where they've really done well is in the cryptocurrency operation, which they work early to market and they're making uh, a significant upsides on that. Uh, Spotify, well, it's done a bit better in the past month, but Spotify is still a company that uh, to me has been unfairly punished because of the fight that went on between Joe Rogan and Neil Young and uh, Joni Mitchell, in fact, also got onto Neil Young's bandwagon, uh, where there was criticism of Joe Rogan. I love the way that Spotify handled the whole thing by saying, we are here for the freedom of speech. And uh, they, they, they manipulated or, or, sorry, maneuvered through an incredibly difficult period uh, very well. The stock market, though, has not yet uh, recognized the, uh, the, the upside of uh, of what occurred there. And I like what Jordan Peterson, who's one of, uh, certainly to me, one of the thought leaders in the world, what he had to say about it, um, when he, he tweeted to say that in a few months time, everyone will have forgotten about the spat and Joe Rogan will have 20 million additional listeners. Well, that certainly does seem to be the way that things are going. And Joe Rogan is uh, tied to the Spotify camp uh, he's exclusively on Spotify, and that's one of the um, one of the major reasons why we like Spotify is because of its focus on podcasts, where Joe Rogan's the biggest podcaster in the in the world. Then Avenge, we remember what happened there. They brought out financial results, um, IFRS related uh, losses that had to be put into the numbers. There was a bit of a panic again by the stock market or by traders. And uh, Avenger is now starting to again improve. It's still an excellent operation. Uh, and uh, then you've got Netflix, which I love. I love Netflix for all the reasons that have been well articulated on uh, these webinars in the past. Wilson Bailey, you might recall a month ago, we got that shock news that it had written off in its entirety its Australian subsidiary. Uh, now, Avenger has got a big uh, subsidiary down in Australasia as well. Um, so Avenge might <laughs> inadvertently be one of the beneficiaries of that. But the shock write-off of Wilson Bailey is still being, it's still permeating through the company. And um, it just doesn't make sense to jump off uh, until you you let the, the share price settle down. It's now got to ex an extremely uh, appealing value proposition. But that's not really what this portfolio is about. We've been reminded again. This is an exponential portfolio. We buy into companies that have exponential opportunities. And uh, were, it, um, were you to, to look at this into the future, I think you will find that we would not have Wilson Bailey in the portfolio. And Avenger is certainly going to have to lift its head up pretty quickly uh, before uh, we, we decide to transfer those funds into something else. But anyway, there's the performance of the stocks in the portfolio. And as you can see, it was a good time to have bought. Uh, it's a big bounce. Uh, the portfolio value in rands, and this is after the rand appreciated strongly. You can see that down the bottom. The rand, 14 rand 74 from 15 rand 25 in February. So despite that strong rand appreciation, the portfolio in rand is up by over 3%, back above 10 million rands. In US dollars, it looks uh, even healthier, 7.5%. Uh, and the S&P 500 index, by comparison, we should actually be comparing it with the NASDAQ, which is what we um, are, are focused on because that's where the tech stocks are. Um, but in this case, we look at the S&P 500 index because the web trader portfolio is a big portfolio and, uh, and, and more of a broader portfolio. So it outperformed the S&P 500. As you can see, although the RAND has strengthened in the past month quite significantly, it's still down a long way from when we began the portfolio at 11.27. And those compound annual growth rates are something that I continue to marvel at. We started the portfolio with $200,000. Um, if you get an 18.5% growth over seven years, and it doesn't sound like much, does it, 18.5%, but if you're able to compound that over seven years, that $200,000 
becomes hey presto six hundred and eighty thousand dollars as you can see there in rand it, uh, with and you can just go up a little bit more or with a call it twenty three percent compound annual growth rate in rands and you go from two and a quarter million rand to over ten million rand and that's what this portfolio has done over that period I, I've um, just kind of put things a little bit you know, usually we put the web trader portfolio in its entirety I, I've compressed it down a little bit so just taken out the uh, the highlights here and just to dwell on it very briefly as you can see um, those who would uh, traditional classic portfolio uh, strategists would say but you far too heavily weighted in Apple and Amazon and indeed even Microsoft seems to be a bit high in your uh, in, in your breakdown but what's happened here is that because of the phenomenal growth in the share prices of those companies um, and because of our view that when you invest in a company, you hold on to it forever. They have taken up an increasing slug of the portfolio. Uh, Warren Buffett says, put all your eggs in one basket, but watch those eggs very carefully. And that's precisely what we're doing here. Watching Amazon and Apple in particular, because it's now 50% of the portfolio, and seeing how well they perform or if there are any dangers. And at the moment, uh, I'm not seeing any issues on the horizon that would concern me or uh, require for us to reassess uh, the shareholding in both of those. Uh, we are holding them forever. If there is a change, obviously, a fundamental change, obviously, we reassess. But at the moment, um, I watch those two, I watch those companies very closely and suggest if you've replicated this portfolio, you do the same. Microsoft has been a, a wonderful performer. Um, it was supposedly going to be one of those stodgy stocks, but it really has done well. As you can see there, um, hundreds of percentage points return uh, on the investment. And the reason we went into Microsoft in the first place was when it changed its business model uh, on its primary business, which is still software, Windows software and Windows Office, or Microsoft Office, from uh, selling one-offs to automated, um, in other words, every month. And that's a, it's a fine business model when you have a customer base that pays you on a monthly basis or automatically, the automated customers, they say. And the change in that business model certainly has transformed Microsoft's uh, bottom line and its, its rating. Purple Capital is a, fair, a relatively recent addition to the portfolio, and that's done very well. And Netflix, as you know, uh, took an awful hiding the share price after the last set of financial results was done by, in fact, it was on the 14th of December that we launched the other port, the shift portfolio. And that night uh, in California, Netflix released its results. Mr. Market hated them and the share price dropped 25% overnight. But we've been accumulating a few more. We finished our accumulation now of Netflix and Spotify indeed, uh, taking advantage of the low share prices. And that is, um, I'm very happy to have nine and seven respectively um, percentage points of this portfolio in there. And uh, you can see the rest of them. Although 2U was a great performer, it's really fallen a long, long way. Sitting at 1% of the portfolio and Wilson Bailey's now down to 3% of the portfolio. Uh, so those two uh, will be sitting there with big question marks next to them into the future when we see uh, better opportunities. But I think really what, what this talks to, this slide talks to, is the allocation of the portfolio and nearly 80% of our stocks have been winners and 20% losers. Of course, had it been the other way around, we would have had a very, very different uh, performance. But it's it's almost like you get on the winners and you ride them. And don't be scared to keep riding them because if you bought them in the first instance at a good price, at good value, and you believe in the company's long term, then don't be spooked by um, changes in the short term. Uh, it's, that's particularly my view on Spotify Zero and 2U at the moment. But as I said, 2U is only 1% of the portfolio. So um, we've got to reassess it and, and, and see how long we hold on to it. In, in this, uh, we, we do like to have stocks that move the needle, obviously. But um, we also know that you buy a share forever. And that's the, the, uh, the counter argument to this. Just moving on to the, the next um, slide, which shows you the performance of the portfolio in RAND. Uh, the uh, pandemic did us well. We made some changes, which with hindsight were extremely fortuitous. Uh, you can see 
the massive uptick in the most recent month uh, after that big sell-off in well sell-off in january december january february wow what a sell-off that we saw um in the u.s markets but there is a bit of an uptick now if that continues and you've got to say to yourself that surely all the bad news has to be written in now you've had putin invading ukraine you've had uh powell saying that we're going to try for a soft landing this is in the united states with the federal reserve but we are going to increase interest rates uh, significantly and yet our portfolio has still managed to 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 hold that ground around 10 million rands worth um and year on year well we even up one percent in rand um, and that would have been quite a bit higher uh, if there had been a, uh, sorry, th- I apologize. That's a little bit out of date. We were 1% up in January. Uh, we took a big knock in February and we're a little bit down now, uh, year on year in March. As you, you can kind of go across there from uh, on those two. I don't know what happened to that slide, my apologies. Uh, there's a better one. Uh, that gives you a better idea on what the portfolio has done year on year. Again, this is in US dollars, nice little, little bump. Uh, in the most recent month. And there you can see the portfolio after all the bad news that we've had in the past couple of months. We're still only down 3% year on year uh, in uh, in March as we stand right now. And of course, looking back, it's uh, not quite double, but it's, it's uh, almost double uh, where the portfolio was uh, when the pandemic hit in March 2020. So it's served us well. Uh, On to the shift portfolio now. This is the one you will just on that we sorry, Alec, can I yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, of course. Just because our purple capital is in the main portfolio. Serena just wanted to know if one had not bought purple before, would you be buying at these current levels? I would, Serena. I'm very uh, I'm very bullish on purple, and I'll tell you why I like it so much. It is transforming a little bit like what what our partner shift is doing that these companies are transforming the investment landscape the retail investment landscape in south africa purple's got over a million registered retail accounts now if you've got a million people who've given you all their details they've given you their uh, fika information i think about three quarters of them over over three quarters of a million have actually put money into those portfolios and are are investing in them. That is a powerful, powerful group of connections that you can then um, serve. And certainly the purple story is you serve at low cost and through fractionalization. And in fact, shift does the same thing. The costs that shift are are incredibly low. Um, And if you get the big numbers that come in there, you are at a situation almost like a Chinese approach to life where their companies work on high volumes, low margins. And if you can get the quality right with high volumes and low margins, it's an irresistible business model. And Purple has continued to innovate. It looks at new ways of doing things. It's uh, it's offering property syndication um, for for the masses at very, very small numbers. It offers, obviously, share investments. Um, You could buy an Amazon, you can buy 100 rands worth of Amazon shares um, uh, through Easy Equities if you want to. So the problem that Easy Equities has got uh, relative to Shift is that it doesn't have the Forex license. So Shift is using the foreign exchange license of Standard Bank and its uh, foreign exchange is really it's almost the differentiator so if you're going to buy into us shares through shift you're going to pay much less the the downside of shift relative to easy equities is that uh, you need a little bit more money uh, for instance you need three thousand dollars or more than three thousand dollars to buy one amazon share at the moment so when shift gets its fractionalization uh, right as i'm sure the guys there are working on it um, that's going to be another challenge to easy equities but on in a broader sense there's a lots of room for both of them. It's a buy, It's like the story of uh, Netflix and Disney and uh, the other streamers, Apple and Amazon. Uh, and quite often, analysts will look at Netflix and say, "But uh, this is is a problem for uh, for Netflix because you've got these other streaming companies that are coming into the market." And 
uh, Reed Hastings, the chief executive, has always asked that question at his quarterly uh, investor calls. And his response is standard. And it's a similar response that you'd have for Purple Capital and, and Shift indeed. And that is they have such a small percentage of the market that they're aiming at. In Netflix's case, in the US, they have 10% of the market, let alone at the tiny, tiny share that they'd have a of the global market. That, uh, and that's streamers in, in, in total. So free to air is, is being eaten up by Netflix and others. But there's so much of a cake for all of them to, to gorge themselves on until market share between themselves become a problem, until they start competing against each other, which they probably won't ever have to do, or not, not ever, but certainly they won't have to do for quite some time. And it's a similar thing, I, th I think, here with Purple Capital and with, uh, with Shift uh, and, and indeed Web Trader. Web Trader is more, uh, more for the full service stockbroking account. Um, Purple Capital's easy equities is low cost and fractionalization, and Shift is uh, low cost uh, foreign exchange international markets, which of course makes them a perfect and uh, ideal partner for us, even more so when they do get the fractionalization when they sort that or decide to introduce that. I don't know, I have no, no vision uh, or no insight on that, visibility on it. But uh, as things stand right now, Purple Capital is, even at the current price, I certainly wouldn't be running away. Uh, the other big thing for Purple Capital is that uh, they've gone early into crypto and many, many of their uh, clients have actually got standing orders to buy crypto. Uh, and whether it's 100 rand a month that they're buying a little slice of Bitcoin or the, the um, crypto portfolio that they have there. So it's so well positioned. And uh, certainly, I think when you look back in five years, and that's got to be your minimum time horizon if you're an investor, uh, you won't be sorry for buying Purple Capital today. Thanks, Alec. Uh, just on this portfolio, Thomas says he's, it seems rather light in terms of the number of shares. He said he'd be happy with a portfolio of 25 across various sectors and geographic markets. Less risk, but no less potential. Yeah, maybe, uh, Thomas, and that I think that's really where the trade-off goes here. What I like to do is to understand the companies that I'm a co-owner of, um, and if I've got 25 of them, it's very difficult for me to understand them, as well as, in this case, uh, many of these shares have been, or these companies have been, I've been a co-owner of them for the last seven years. So I read the quarterlies, I pay attention to it. You build up knowledge. And I, I, if you're going to have 25 shares, I, I would probably be looking rather at an exchange traded fund um, because it'll be a little difficult to follow or to understand. Um, I mean, you're talking about 25 shares, you've got quarterly, that's 100 quarterly reports that you're going to have to analyze and read in a year. Um, you can't do justice, or I can't do, you can maybe, but I can't do justice to them. So that's the reason why I've done uh, I've stuck to these uh, to to relatively few uh, stocks in the portfolio. Also, it is the view that whenever I buy a share, I want to be sure that I'm going to hold it forever. So again, that kind of obviates against having many of them, um, primarily because if you're going to do so much research and you've got 25 stocks, well, you can only put an average of four percent in each. Um, and you know, I suppose some of them are going to grow, like Amazon. We started with only 8% in Amazon, and you can see where it is today. But it, it's different strokes, and if you're happy with 25 shares and you can follow them all, brilliant. Um, I, I don't feel that, um, from my perspective, that I can actually understand. It, it, it's like, for me, um, I used to be uh, on a couple of... Um, uh, companies' boards, and in fact, three at one stage maximum. And my own company uh, at then was listed called MoneyWeb, uh, and then on the board of Classic FM and on the board of Pumalela. And those three kept me more than occupied uh, as a director, non exec on two of them, to understand what was going on. As an investor, obviously, you're not as, as intimately involved as a director of a company is you need to be spending enough time reading annual reports and actually knowing 
uh, as a co-owner what that company is up to and what it's doing. That helps when you've got time and you've got them in your portfolio for a long time. But uh, when it comes to allocating your your uh, your investment of your time, and time is the most precious resource um, on earth, uh, then I like to just I like to know more about the companies, and then hopefully you're not going to be uh, caught offside. But of course, <laughs> that happens all the time. Look at what happened with Wilson Bailey. I know the company well, very well. Um, but what happened with Wilson Bailey in Australia was just a complete surprise. Um, and I guess that's why what we're doing here is we're investing for the long term in companies where there's always risk. Uh, and that's, on the one hand, some people think, well, reduce the risk by diversifying. On the other hand, uh, people like me say, well, reduce the risk by actually knowing the companies better. Thanks, Alec. I think as we, we can shift to shift, as they say. Let's do it. Okay, there we go. So the shift portfolio started at probably the worst possible time, um, which was on the 14th of December. As I say, uh, one of our big holdings there, as you can see, Netflix, which uh, is 12% of the portfolio now, it's gone down a little. Um, Netflix came out with its financial results the night of the launch of this portfolio, and the share price dropped 25%. Um, the Mr. Market didn't like the results. I looked at them again. And I looked at them again, and I felt, well, you know, this is a five-year project. Um, Netflix has the structure, has the strategy, has where Netflix is going changed. Uh, was the fact that the forecast growth in new subscribers was lower than what Mr. Market wanted? Was that a worry to me? Uh, no. Uh, had Mr. Market been pricing the shares for perfection? Of course he had. Uh, and so there probably was a reason for Mr. Market to panic. But at these levels with Netflix, my goodness, I'm very happy that we've got it in the portfolio at this, this area. Um, we started off here with a breakdown of that exchange traded fund. There it is in Besco, QQQ. Um, and that's the NASDAQ 100. So it's a little bit like diversification. But the way we work here is to put... Uh, and we started the, we did the web trader portfolio in the same way. We had quite a big chunk in an exchange traded fund. There it was in the S&P 500. And then as you go forward and you find stocks that you want to own forever, because it takes a lot of research and understanding to get there, then you reduce your holding in the exchange traded fund and you put that money into the new stocks. Now here's, it's very interesting because we bought the first tranche, $10,000, in uh, at the worst possible time, I think, 14th of December. Uh, then the NASDAQ, as you well recall, uh, fell quite significantly in the next month. So we bought the second tranche, and this is my own money, as I said earlier. And then the third tranche of $10,000 was, uh, was done on the 24th of February. So all the purchasing has been done as it happens, and you'll see in a moment. Um, the, the first one was very high, the second one was a little bit lower, but still high. The third one was relatively low, and the market, um, Mr. Market has just bumped up a little bit from there. But I would urge you to, if there's one thing that you can learn from our model here, it is that you need to stagger your purchases over three months. You, if, if the share prices go up after you've bought for the first month, good luck. You know, good luck. It's it's fine. You, you, you will uh, look back on it and probably feel uh, a little bit aggrieved that you you didn't buy them all in the first chunk. But if the share prices go down, uh, you will be grateful that you didn't jump in boots and all on a particular day. And the reason why we stagger it over three months is because we really don't want the share prices of a portfolio. Uh, and, and remember here, we only do these trades in the portfolio on the day, or in this case, on the evening after we've engaged with our community. There's no other ethical way of doing it. You can't go out and start buying shares in between. Um, you can imagine it, it becomes a, a bit of an ethical nightmare uh, for people will say, well, you know, how do we know that you actually bought the stock at the low on the 13th of, of February or whatever? So this is the way that we do it. We're playing, um, uh, giving you a model from which you can do your own research. 
And you can see, thankfully, that we now have two stocks that have actually already broken into positive, um, despite those very high purchases first time around. Cloudflare, I, I continue to to love that stock, and it's it's a it's it's still very sad to me that we sold Cloudflare in the other portfolio at sixty dollars, but we did buy it at twenty dollars. So I suppose um, it it was looking at a stage uh, that that it was incredibly rich, and lots of people were saying companies, uh, these smaller tech companies that had been were in bubbles. And foolishly, just like with Tesla, I listened to that story. I should not. Next time, uh, follow the own advice and you hold on to the share forever. But it is what it is, and and uh, and that's where we are. But if you have a look here, the Nasdaq itself, which is reflected by Vesco QQQ, is only down 3.1% uh, through the, the strategy that we used. Um, and if you look at the big stocks, the three big stocks, that is nearly just over 60% of the portfolio has been a relatively small decline from uh, a NASDAQ, which has really, really been under pressure. And then you look at the bottom there and the total portfolio because of that is down 6.4%, despite some very big knocks um, in Netflix on the one hand, Zoom on the other hand, and Spotify on the other. So I suppose the obvious question here is to say, well, do you now start selling those shares that have fallen sharply? Obviously not. You you like them in the first place because you'd like to be a co-owner of that company in five years' time. None of those companies have shown any change in their fundamental uh, uh, appreciate or appeal. So as a consequence of that, uh, there's no real there's no reason to to uh, make any changes. But I wanted to just show you this: the benefit of staggered purchases. If you'd bought Nasdaq with U.S. dollars. On the 14th of December, you'd be down eight and a half percent today. If you'd bought it on the 20th of January, so in other words, let's just say we'd launched this portfolio a month later, well, we've only been down 1.7 percent. And if we'd launched the portfolio two months later, uh, we would be up 3.3 percent. But you know, who knows what the future holds, especially um, when it comes to share markets. But having done this over three months, the the Nasdaq, the the timing has been improved. And as you can see there, our Invesco QQQ, which is a direct reflection of where the market was, is down by 3.1%. So again, if that doesn't prove the point to you that staggering your purchases is a good thing, uh, then hopefully this next uh, little number that I pulled out will. This is taking the RAND and then uh, applying that to the Invesco QQQ price to give you a RAND price of Invesco QQQ. And as you could see, so let's just say you put 100% into this exchange traded fund. You said, yeah, I like exponential companies. I want the NASDAQ 100. Uh, instead of losing 8% or 8.5% since December, you'd have lost nearly 17% in RAND terms. Uh, and there you can see in January, 6% uh, if you'd bought in there, which is around about where we are at the moment. Or, or then if you'd bought in February, you'd have only lost 1% at the, at the bottom of the market on the 24th of February. So when you've got two variables that are as potent as share prices and the RAND exchange rate, RAND dollar exchange rate, best you, you try and reduce the risk as much as possible. Uh, and that kind of makes the point, I think. Okay, on to the big story for today. We are tiptoeing into crypto tonight. Uh, at the Biz News conference in March, beginning of March, we had a Phenomenal presentation from my old friend, um, Stafford Marcy, who I've known for more than a decade. Uh, he, he served on, uh, I asked him to serve on the MoneyWeb board, which he did until I left when he left there as well. He's, um, he was very senior in Google. He's an entrepreneur who, um, he's just one of those like, super smart guys who are ahead of the game on most things to do with tech. And anybody who was at the Biz News Conference will know that when Stafford uh, had finished talking to us about crypto, well, our our knowledge, first of all, was a lot better. And uh, on the second point, you you kind of had to look at it and say, wait a minute, maybe Nura Rubini and uh, even the great Warren Buffett have got this one wrong. Maybe they're looking at it from a different perspective. And maybe it's time to start doing some serious analysis of what 
crypto is all about. So I did that. I was away last week and I just consumed a number of books. Primarily, uh, the one that I'd recommend to you is the one called the Bitcoin Standard. Um, it is a wonderful uh, explanation of why Bitcoin has investment appeal. Most of the time, I was looking at Bitcoin from the perspective of, but hang on, you know, this is anonymous and uh, governments are going to are going to regulate it, and they're going to squash it, and they're going to make sure that um, it it isn't used anymore. And then the the price can come crumbling down or, or crashing down. But what I learned in the Bitcoin Standard is something, in fact, that I wrote about in my very first investment book, which was probably going back twenty years now. And and he starts the author, who's a professor, Jordanian professor, um, is starts by explaining the people of an island called Yap. And what they did in Yap, and and, uh, and as I say, I did write about the island of Yap because it's a well-known monetary story, uh, was that they for, for centuries used stones, big stones, as their source of value uh, until a, an Irishman called David O'Keefe um, was shipwrecked and landed up on this island and said, hang on a minute, if I can go and get these same stones, which had to be brought in from an island a long, long way away and mined very in, in very difficult fashion. So in other words, these stones were were hard to find and, and difficult to get. Uh, if I could do that, uh, then I'll become the king of Yap. And so he did that. He actually went to Hong Kong once he'd left there, uh, came back, uh, went and mined these, these uh, massive stones, identical to the, the currency that they had on the island went back to the island and of course the wise old folk there said whoa we can't use this as currency because uh, this is not uh, it's it's going to destroy our whole monetary system um, but there were enough who believed in O'Keefe and of course the obvious happened uh, there was an inflation of the of the currency uh, as they had it and that was the end of yap that was the end of the the yap system and they then the whole economy crashed but it's it's a wonderful uh, example because it tells us more and more what uh, or explains to us and he goes through many of these examples what is currency and for many years the world was on the gold standard and the reason why gold worked so well is that it is rare and that the, that it is hard to get and it grows annually by around about the supply grows around about one and a half percent so the stock, he talks about a, a stock to growth ratio and the stock of gold is, and it's been mined since man kind of existed almost, um, is X and or say 100. And then next year, the stock is going to be 101.5. And it's that kind of appreciation, tiny appreciation every year, which then matches economic growth. And as a consequence, the, the, there is a, a restriction in value. And what he's done, the prof, is he's gone back and, and used, for instance, oil and priced oil in gold and shown how gold has kept its value relative to oil for a century. And that's where you start. Now, there was a, a time when all currencies were, in fact, after uh, the Second World War, and please forgive me if I'm giving you an, a history lesson here, but I kind of needed to understand it myself. After the Second World War, there was a, a, an agreement at Bretton Woods where the Americans then became the, the leaders of the, of the world and all other currencies could then get converted into US dollars at a fixed rate and US dollars were converted into gold at a fixed rate. So everything was backed then by gold. That went out the window in 1971 and since then a dollar is worth a dollar. So it's, it's, there's nothing backing it. The problem that you have in a system like this is when governments start creating a currency out of thin air, it's like O'Keefe on the island of Yap, arriving with those other stones, it debases the value of the currency. And that's really where the whole argument begins. Then you say, okay, we're in a digital age. How, is there anything that we can use which is a currency which will have limited supply, won't be debased, and will be accepted, like the islanders of Yap accepted those uh, 
those stones and most people around the world accept US dollars. Is there anything like that? And that's where Bitcoin comes in. It's been around for 10 years. Uh, it is now so widely accepted that many people see it as a store of value. It does not grow. It cannot grow. Uh, it's going to be a maximum of 21 million coins, which will be finally mined. Uh, I think it's in 2150. Um, there's smaller and smaller additions to the stock of, of Bitcoins come on every year. We're nearly there already in 2025. I think we're at 20 million coins already. So there's fewer and fewer new coins that are coming in. And people who argue that but Bitcoin will never be like a dollar, you're never going to go and take a 0.0001 or, uh, of a Bitcoin or Satoshi or what fraction of a Satoshi, as they call it, it's like their cents, and go and buy a pizza or burger for it. Um, of course, but that's not the point. The point is it's like gold. You didn't use in the Middle Ages and, and other times, they didn't go in and use gold coins to buy their meals. They used silver or bronze coins. And that's the same thing here with Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm, I'm far enough along the understanding of Bitcoin and what it's about to say what Pete Fulion said a while ago. He said, you must have some of your portfolio in Bitcoin. And that's why we have uh, made the decision that we'll be buying uh, BRTO, which is the Bitcoin ETF, 2% um, of the portfolio. Um, in this, well, not even 2% of the portfolio, um, but it'll be a maximum, it'll be 5% over the next three months. We're going to buy some of those tonight. Uh, one uh, uh, micro strategy share, which is uh, the reason coming up over here. But let's just start off with a Bitcoin strategy ETF or BCO. Um, it is the, it was the first Bitcoin fund on the New York Stock Exchange listed only on the 19th of October. And uh, it's an exchange traded fund with a, a low expense rate. Uh, it'll track the Bitcoin price. Nice place to, rather than buying an absolute an out and out Bitcoin, which we can't in this portfolio, because a Bitcoin, as you are probably well aware, costs over $40,000. But here we can take a fraction of a Bitcoin. So that's going to be one part of it. There's going to be 5% of the portfolio in this after three months, in three months' time. And then micro strategy. Here's an interesting one. This is a company that is run by uh, Michael Saylor, who uh, is is some kind of a whiz kid, uh, genius futurist, um, who actually was asked to write the intro to the Bitcoin standard. So uh, he's, he's clearly a chap who knows about crypto. Um, the company, MicroStrategy, believes that Bitcoin will become uh, a, a store of value into the future, more valuable than, than fiat currency, as they call them, or paper that's issued by governments. And this company owns 125,000 Bitcoin, which is valued at $5.4 billion. The market cap of the stock today at $450 a share, which we'll be buying our one share at tonight, is just over $5 billion, $5.1 billion. So you're getting a discount of 5% uh, on the Bitcoin price, and you get the rest of the company for free. Uh, it's a little bit like buying into NASPERS uh, when you wanted 10 cent. Um, you'd be getting it at a big discount uh, and get the rest of the company for free. Well, MicroStrategy is that way. It's the one listed. It's a listed company uh, and it's one way into a Bitcoin at a discount. So that's what the big decision has been. Stu, uh, I know there's a big change for us, but uh, perhaps there's some questions about that. Question. I thought there would, as you tiptoe to crypto, like I thought there would have been a host of questions on Bitcoin, but there's not at the moment. So I encourage those to please be put through. Uh, Carla has just a question on, she says, ask where you can find the portfolio, but I'm sure you can answer that for her quite simply, Alec, because she says she's looked on Shift and obviously can't find it there. No, uh, it's it's on business. Oh, well, you know, Stu, you're the managing editor. No, so you, you can't, that people try, want to invest directly into your portfolio where ultimately we need to, they need to replicate the portfolio on shift as their own, Alec. I think that's where the question is heading towards. Uh, it's not, an, it's not yeah. a portfolio you can invest into. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's a model portfolio. And we do that very, very specifically. Uh, some years ago, uh, we started putting, our, um, we started a portfolio at Easy Equities and the, the the problem was there was so much money that was attracted by it that in a very very short period of time 
uh, I knew that if we were going to continue with the portfolio, I would have to become a fund manager full time um, to have the responsibility for all this money that people have been entrusting uh, to to my thought processes, uh, and that would mean uh, you know changing career direction. Hey, I'm not a portfolio manager. That's uh, they're much better people at that. Pete Fillion is. Uh, uh, Sar Jacobs, who's coming to um, the next business conference, these guys are, are, are outstanding and they will look after your money if that's what you're looking for, somebody to actually run a portfolio for you. Uh, what we're doing here is we're giving you a model so that you can then go and read up about these companies and decide which of them you like and which of them you would like to invest in. And then every month as a Biz News Premium subscriber, you come to this webinar and I give you an update on what the companies have done. Now, this month, obviously, because we've got this new portfolio, haven't really given you that much of an update of the individual companies. Uh, that often happens in some depth after they report quarterly results. But it is, it's a way for you to almost check your own, your own portfolio, to check in every month, uh, see, well, have Microsoft done anything crazy? Um, what's ooh, good news coming out of Amazon with a 20 for one share split and, and they're going to invest $10 billion into buying back their own shares. Am I excited about Amazon? What a question. Um, in fact, I'm reading right now, I'm reading another book on Amazon, which has, has made me even more excited about the company. So it's, it's that kind of thing. And then you can say, well, maybe I don't, think that uh, Daniel Ek is the genius that Alec thinks he is, the, the founder and CEO of Spotify, um, because I don't think he handled the whole Joe Rogan, um, Joni Mitchell, uh, Neil Young, uh, cracker as well as he should have. And then you make your own decisions. But this is really, it's a, it's a portfolio for you to look at, uh, to consider. You can replicate it. Of course you can. You can put half of your, uh, of, of of what you want to invest into this portfolio. But we've kept it at $10,000 to give you anybody really who is an investor an opportunity to replicate this portfolio um, within their own means. Uh, my, my feeling has always been that whatever you're going to, whatever capital you're going to allocate, and if you, you're going to produce exactly the same thing, please just remember to split it over three months, especially because of the RAND and uh, off share price movements. Thanks, Alec. And I see Pete and his team actually won an award at the Morningstar ceremony the other day for the best South African equity fund. So he's definitely a good fund manager, as we know very well here. Pete's the best. He's, um, uh, he's been at each of our, our uh, business uh, conferences, and he's back again uh, at the next one, at August, September. And, and anybody who, who sits and listens to Pete realizes that we've got, we've got an extraordinary uh, human being, let alone a uh, fund manager, in South Africa, in the form of, in the shape of Pete Fulion. Uh, and he's, he's just such a rational man. He, he's, uh, he's the closest thing we've got here to Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, by my, in my opinion, anyway. Thanks, Alec. Oratili just says, on the crypto focus, will it only be Bitcoin or will you look at things like Ethereum or she says any other of the coins available? Oratili, I'm, uh, I'm such a novice at this uh, that I, I'm going to just stick to what I know at the moment. I get the understand. I understand Bitcoin. I understand exactly what the the uh, protagonists of Bitcoin, or now I do anyway, why they say that it's a good investment and a good store of value. Um, I get that. The rest of them I'm going to have to learn about. And I am in the process of reading a lot of books to try and understand that. We'll be doing a lot of interviews with people on uh, on the whole NFTs, Ethereum, um, other other coins, stable coins. It's, it's, a, it's like, the only way I can describe it is a little boy, I used to read newspapers voraciously. I had my own newspaper round uh, as an eight-year-old. And often there were people who you'd deliver the papers to and then they'd say, no, you, you know, you don't, they don't want it anymore. They canceled or please don't bring it. And then you'd end up with newspapers at home, uh, which gave me more of an excuse, I suppose, to read. It was only on a Sunday that I did the the rounds, but I used to read those Sunday newspapers from cover to cover, the whole thing. And there was always those days a big, at least one page, 
sometimes two on horse racing and I'd skip over that page until one day I thought, hang on, I'm not getting great value here. Let me read about them. And so help me that will pull me into a horse racing industry, which um, is maybe the fastest way to lose money, but it was great fun anyway. Um, and I think it's something similar here. I knew nothing about horse racing and ended up years later breeding horses, taking a, a, a break from, from a, my career to, to go for a couple of years and actually raise thoroughbreds on, on a farm in Moy River. And it's something like that for me with crypto. I don't know a lot about it. I've been reading enough to say, hang on, I, I get, I get why, why Bitcoin is a, is a store of value. And I do think that the argument is right. And I do think that it's time for our portfolio to start reflecting, my own portfolio to start reflecting that. And hence uh, the investments that we're going to make tonight. But when you come to other things, I'm going to Davos uh, to the World Economic Forum in May. And the last time I attended, uh, shoo, it's like four years ago now because of, of uh, COVID and so on, the Ethereum was very, very strongly represented there. And I just walked past it. This time I'm going to pop in. I'm going to go and talk to the guys. I'm going to go and learn about it more. I'll keep my eyes open. I'll go into the, uh, the, the events at Davos where they do talk about crypto and start absorbing more and more of this NFTs, um, this whole new world that's opening for us. My friend Stafford, who's been bugging me for probably seven or eight years to buy Bitcoin, and I never listened to him. Um, but what did I know? I didn't know anymore. Uh, and he's he's obviously done incredibly well out of it. Um, he says to me that this is bigger than the dawning of the internet. This is bigger than the dawning of the internet. And I was around at the dawning of the internet. You might recall I, I gave up a really good career path to go and start MoneyWeb um, above my garage and had to fund myself for, for quite some time. But that was what I saw in the internet. Now, Stafford sees the same thing in the whole cryptocurrency and its derivative area. And he's so smart that I, I understand that he's, I should have listened to him a long time ago, but at least I'm listening now. And I think that's really the story here. But he says the other thing, he says, we are just at the dawning of the age, of the new age. So it's not too late for all of us to, who don't know anything about this field to start understanding it, but it's going to be a long process. I, I appreciate that. Bitcoin I'm happy with for now. Ethereum, I don't know. I don't know about Ethereum, but I will learn more about it and share it, of course. Thanks, Alec. It seems this is the quickest 60, 60 minutes of every month um, as we've almost finished with an hour. But um, let's just close off with a question from Roshan. She just wants to know your views on the fall of Naspers recently. Roshan, I, um, uh, it's a very difficult one to answer because when the Chinese government uh, moved or started changing its approach. First of all, when President Xi changed their constitution so he became a president for life, uh, that was a big warning sign. And then secondly, when he moved in a, in a very aggressive manner against the incredible success stories that China has delivered Primarily Tencent. Remember, when you're buying Naspers today, you're buying Tencent. D don't don't fool yourself. It's Naspers has got lots of other bets. Um, a huge bet that they've made is in food delivery, and Amazon moved out of food delivery because they said it's a bad area, it's a bad market. They couldn't Amazon couldn't make money there. So Naspers has doubled up and doubled up and doubled up again in food delivery. And you got to sit back and say, whoa. Uh, is Bob Van Dijk smarter than Jeff Bezos? Mm. Uh, so anyway, just getting back to 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 the other part of NASPAS, which the market is telling you is going to be value destructive. So what they're spending their money on uh, is is not appealing here in this country. In fact, they've been very smart. They've done a they've done a fantastic job on uh, starting Luna, uh, which could be a, a terrific bet for them. But in a global sense, it's it's pretty small. So let's just get back to the reason why I got worried about Naspers and we dropped it out of the portfolio at far, far higher than the current price. Uh, when President Key made that change and then he started attacking individual industries in China, um, it, it rang all kinds of alarm bells for anybody who's, who had a big stake in Naspers. 
And the main alarm bell there was that if he was prepared to to uh, fine companies like Tencent, which was a, well billions of dollars anyway, or, or insist that they pay billions of dollars on this common prosperity in inverted commas, then he's he's unraveling everything that Deng Xiaopo uh, did 30 years ago that changed China from being very backward into the economic engine uh, of Asia. And remember Deng said, I don't care what color the cat is, as long as it catches mice. And what he meant by that was that they have a political system which is controlled and communist and, and centrally controlled, but the economic system is entrepreneurial. And what uh, President Key is doing is he is transforming that uh, entrepreneurial enterprise, free enterprise economic system into a communist system, uh, it's communist economy. And no communist economy has worked anywhere in the world. There have been unmitigated disasters and they can only work, communist economies can only work if your entrepreneurs are not treated uh, as icons as they had be started becoming in China. And the best example there is the uh, is the chief executive Jack Ma or the founder um, of uh, Alibaba who literally disappeared. He disappeared for about nine months. He popped up on some video which seemed to be in incredibly obviously staged and then he's disappeared since. So if that's what happens if you're an entrepreneur in China, uh, then if the government says, listen, Mr. Tencent, which is what you're buying when you're buying NASPERS, uh, we need you to give us $10 billion or we need you to cut your profit margin from, I don't know, 40% to 1%. Uh, you as the chief executive really don't have a leg to stand on and you've got to go with it. So it fundamentally changed the outlook for that company, as brilliant a company as Tencent is. It's become a different, it's a Chinese company. It is, it is uh, a subject to Chinese regulations and to Chinese politicians who run the country and the economy uh, with absolute power. And if you're, you're prepared to put your money into that, uh, then be my guest. For me, it's too high a risk. And that's really what happened with, with my view of NASPERS, I'm afraid. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. Uh, we've come just on one o'clock, so I think we can end up here. Huh? Yeah, I think we can. I see there are quite a few other questions. Sorry, guys. In, in future, if you wouldn't mind uh, just popping those questions up a little earlier, and uh, we look forward to being back with you in a month's time. And let's hope we see more green on the screen from the shift portfolio <laughs> now that we've finished all our, our purchases. Of course, if, you, if you're doing your purchases, and, and as, as counterintuitive as it is, you should be trying to organize or try, hoping that uh, the, the, uh, the share prices go down. Um, that's because you get more of the shares, the lower the share price is. Now that we've finished our purchases, um, we want the share prices obviously not to go down anymore, please. <laughs> but uh, it, we've, we've had everything thrown at us. We've had, we've had uh, inflation, we've had um, interest rates in America, and of course we've had Putin invading. Uh, Ukraine, which changes so much on the global scene, and yet the portfolio is still holding its head. So, remember, it's a five-year project, and as long as as long as you can sleep at night, as long as you don't go to bed at night and say, "Oh my goodness, I've got so much money tied up in the business shift portfolio, uh, I, I'm going to have nightmares." Well, then then you are um, you're not an investor. Then you are trading. You invest in something where you fight that that human fear or that human condition of wanting everything now. Um, and you actually say, don't worry, it's gonna all, it's a long-term uh, uh, scenario. And in five years time, if the other portfolio is anything to go by, the web trader portfolio, then we will have done uh, pretty happily, pretty well out of the shift portfolio then. Thanks, Alec.